Okay, uh, so let me continue where I left off. So, if you remember that I was trying to uh, motivate the introduction of non-equilibrium Green's function. So, so the idea was that um, if the system was in equilibrium, that means there was some kind of a, a reservoir at some temperature T and uh, which is basically 1 by beta and the system was in thermal contact with the reservoir. So, it would come to an equilibrium and in such a situation uh, I uh, hopefully managed to convince you that the particle Green's function and the whole Green's function are related to each other in a rather simple way. If you pretend that the times uh, that are involved are uh, on the imaginary axis. So, in other words, if I shift uh, one of the times to uh, the original time uh, minus i beta h bar, I get back the, uh, if it is a particle Green's function, I will get back uh, the um, whole Green's function except that there will be some factor uh, which is either positive or negative depending upon whether it is boson or fermion. So, bottom line is that uh, there is this kind of a periodicity. So, in other words the uh, particle Green's function becomes the whole Green's function and the whole becomes particle if I uh, shift by a discrete amount on the imaginary axis. And besides uh, the Green's functions for systems in thermal equilibrium, basically equilibrium Green's functions are uh, time translation invariant. That means, if I shift my origin of uh, that means, if I if I call the 0 of my clock uh, something else. So, I am measuring times using a clock. So, instead of calling 0 what it was earlier, I uh, call my 0 of the clock, I start counting from some other time. Uh, nothing is going to change because you see the Green's function depends only on the time elapsed between the, uh, so in equilibrium the Green's function will only depend on the time elapsed between inserting a particle and removing a particle if I am talking about say the particle Green's function, but it depends upon. Uh, so, if I am talking about the whole Green's function, it would depend upon the time interval between removing a particle and inserting the particle. So, bottom line is it only depends on the difference between the times. Uh, the two times that are involved. So, similarly, if the system is spatially homogeneous and that would be the case for example, if uh, there are no external, uh, there is no positive charge that is uh, you know located at some discrete lattice point. So, if there are uh, positive charges located at discrete lattice points that is typical in a solid, then of course, uh, the Green's function will continue to be temporally homogeneous. That means that there will be time translation invariance, but the space translation invariance will not be there, except there may be a discrete space translation invariance, but the continuous the smooth type of translational invariance in space will be absent. But it is typical, you know, in many body theory to uh, pretend. So, even if you are, so you might be thinking that where, when is the situation you will encounter where uh, you will encounter a spatially homogeneous system because that seems rather unnatural in a solids because in solid the positive charges are uh, uh, located at some fixed lattice location. So, there is, uh, so there the spatial homogeneity is lost. So, now the answer to that question is that you can still uh, uh, you know, so if your goal is to study the, uh, the many body dynamics of the electrons in the solid, it is really a distracting complication to have a lattice to deal with. So, that means it is better to somehow uh, make the lattice less important because we are interested in highlighting the many body aspect of the problem. So, the way to uh, highlight the many body aspect of the problem is to introduce a device called the uh, jellium. So, that means a jellium is a kind of a fictitious uh, caricature or a cartoon of a solid. So, there you take a real solid and you look at the positive charges which are located at those fixed points, I mean at, the, at those lattice points. 
then uh, you pretend those uh, i mean in your this is all in your head i mean you know, in your mind it's a mental picture so you pretend those uh, positive charges are something that you can smear out with your fingers so so the strength of you see the the positive charges you could just think of them as pencil marks on a piece of paper so because all those positive charges are concentrated at a point that pencil mark will be very dark and very localized because that's all concentrated at a point so now imagine you place a finger on a pencil mark which corresponds to a positive charge at a lattice point and then you just uh, rub your finger around and smear out that positive charge all over the interparticle spacing that means the interatomic spacing will be white because it doesn't contain positive charges so you smear it out uh, and you do it for all the other positive charges so then you see you will be conserving the total positive charge because you are not destroying any charge because you merely smearing it out now the plus point of doing that is now your positive charge is spatially homogeneous because you have smeared it out so now but then you see the even though you have smeared out the positive charges they still are inert in the sense that they, their only role is to uh, provide charge neutrality because you see the actual system that we are dealing with that contributes to the dynamics is the electrons in the solid so is the electrons in the solid that participate in the quantum dynamics so the uh, positive charges are there just to hold the electrons together because otherwise without the positive charges the electrons being uh, mutually they are all negative charges so they will mutually repel and fly apart so there has to be something holding them together and that something holding them together should uh, be only for that purpose I means its only job should be to hold the electrons together it should not contribute to its own dynamics i mean in a real solid it does but then this is the cartoon version of the solid where i am trying to minimize these distracting complications and focus only on the uh, many body aspects of the electrons so in that case uh, i create this kind of a mental picture of a solid where the positive charges have all been smeared out and made uniform and uh, that uniform positive charge is completely inert and its only role is to provide charge neutrality and now the real uh, objects or entities that participate in the quantum dynamics are the electrons so this sort of model of a solid uh, cartoon model of a solid is called a jellium okay so it's it's called jellium model jellium so it is quite popular and people um, study it okay so but that was uh, you know i mean i'm just trying to remind you where i uh, left off in last few classes so i was basically studying uh, such a solid or or even a solid with an actual lattice but at equilibrium so the point is that the system is in contact with some surroundings so but then uh, in uh, in many other applications you may be interested in you know disturbing the uh, system in question momentarily say maybe you want to shine a laser pulse on the system and uh, try to uh, you know use some uh, very short time probes like femtoseconds laser spectroscopy and try to find the uh, dynamics of the electrons that uh, you know how the electrons uh, respond to such a short but intense laser pulse so in order to uh, answer such questions which are of quite uh, significant importance and interest nowadays because technologically it's possible to uh, you know achieve those kinds of uh, high intensity very short laser beams that can probe uh, you know processes that occur at uh, picosecond sub picosecond time scales so in other words in order to do that you really have to understand how to generalize this concept of green's function to systems that are now no longer in equilibrium so when the system is not in equilibrium you can see that the the green's function is not a function any more of uh, the time difference between the two times so it, now we see this uh, external 
short duration uh, disturbance determines uh, in some sense uh, it, it biases your origin of time selection. That means it, uh, so because that uh, disturbance happens at a given time, so you, it is more convenient to refer to uh, time duration as being you know after this uh, disturbance or before this disturbance. So now you see the, the system is uh, no longer going to depend only on the time duration between uh, creating and annihilating, but rather it also depends on uh, how long after this disturbance you are doing that creating and annihilating. So it is going to independently depend on the, those two times. So that is the reason why uh, uh, you need a non-equilibrium Green's form. So uh, anyway, I, I think I kind of, um, these sort of uh, qualitative descriptions are important because uh, uh, firstly, you know, this uh, formal uh, algebraic uh, manipulations and these uh, formal proofs and all that, uh, in, in any case you can read them from the books and it is very, uh, it is not that convenient for me to describe in words what is going on because it is pretty self evident what is going on. You just need the patience to read whatever is written in the book. But nevertheless, uh, I do not want to disappoint those of you who are actually interested in uh, knowing from an instructor what is there in the books. So uh, bottom line is I remember that this is where I had stopped. So I told you that in you know Heisenberg picture the annihilation operator evolves according to this and uh, so now you see in a situation where uh, the system is uh, you know is, a system is such that the Hamiltonian is explicitly time dependent then you will be forced to introduce this evolution operator uh, which depends on these two times okay. So it is going to depend on these two times and this is the so called S matrix that depends on the part of the Hamiltonian that is explicitly time dependent. So uh, after this uh, it is a whole bunch of uh, formal results, so I uh, am going to skip all this and tell you what it is I have achieved here. See bottom line is that all, whatever um, before this 10.90 and after 10.78, so you might be wondering what are all these equations, see basically those equations are merely uh, required those steps are merely required to prove this sort of uh, group property of this S matrix. So it is like a, you know this is somewhat reminiscent of group theory. So you have this uh, S matrix and you compose it with some other matrix you will get some other. So it is like something like a you can think of it in various ways, uh, but bottom line is this is what it is. So I have spent uh, some few steps trying to prove this. And then uh, I have also proved that S is unitary, so F stagger S is 1. So these two put together uh, are quite important because they will uh, you know enable you to do many things nicely. So now the, okay, so this is all rather straightforward algebra, there is no physics content there. So the real physics content comes, uh, in fact will come a little later. So in order to motivate the physics content, I have to tell you why we introduce this, uh, this S matrix approach by the way is called the interaction picture. So you remember that in uh, quantum mechanics there are three uh, types of so called pictures. One is the Schrodinger picture where the uh, operators are explicitly time independent but uh, the states, uh, the wave function or the states are time dependent. So there is the exact opposite where uh, the states are time independent, but the operators are explicitly time dependent. So that is what this would be for example, okay. So 10.76 would correspond to the Heisenberg picture. So the interaction picture is somewhere in midway between the Heisenberg and the uh, Schrodinger picture. So that means what we do is that we say that uh, both states and operators evolve with time except the state evolves according to the time independent part of the Hamiltonian, uh, right? Whereas the um, operators evolve according to the time dependent part of the Hamiltonian. So which is why there is this thing.
so the idea is that uh, the uh, so this is the this is evolved uh, according to uh, to h so remember h of s is equal to h plus v of s so it is the v of s which is time dependent so this is time independent h is time independent so this this operator sitting in the middle with that caret on top this uh, this hat or whatever you want to call it so that is uh, evolving according to the time independent part of the hamiltonian whereas the this is the overall time evolution of uh, the uh, annihilation operator with respect to the full hamiltonian so now that full evolution is completely determined by this uh, evolution with respect to the time independent part sandwiched between the s matrices so that's basically it so now why do we do this why do we introduce the s matrix we introduce the s matrix because so remember uh, if you want to think of this time uh, dependent part as a perturbation so that means if you want to think of this v as a perturbation what you have to do is it is very logical and very obvious that it is convenient uh, this S matrix approach is especially convenient to uh, perform perturbation series because after all what is S? S is just the time ordering of this sort of an exponential in. Now if I expand in powers of V I will just get a series. So basically that is what it is. So now, uh, so that is basically um, the motivation for introducing S matrix first of all. It is motivated because you, are, you can do perturbation theory cleanly because you see the thing, the operators that are in between, they are evolving according to the unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian which is also time independent. So the time dependent parts are the ones which are, are contained in the S matrix and which you can nicely expand in powers of V. So but then uh, so that is the advantage of doing that. So when you actually start performing this calculation you will uh, then start to notice some uh, not so convenient feature and that not so convenient feature is already obvious here in 10.83. So the not so convenient feature is the following that you see, uh, so you have committed to expanding in powers of this uh, V of S which is the time dependent part of the potential. But then uh, now you are forced to expand, uh, you are forced to perform this expansion in two places, one is here and the other is here. So that means you are forced to expand. Uh, in powers of V in two different places and that is not very convenient because then you will get all kinds of cross terms from all over. If you go to high orders, you will get a bunch of cross terms which is really annoying and they are all on either side of this psi. So uh, there is a very clever way of getting around this issue. So you might think that why should you get around this issue, so be it, I mean that if that is how it is, that is how it is. Let's, uh, let's just grin and bear it. I mean you might take that point of view and uh, technically you would not be wrong. I mean uh, you know if you are willing to put in the effort nobody is going to prevent you. But then it is certainly not elegant especially in hindsight when you know that there is a better way. So the point is that there is a better way and that better way involves uh, again uh, you might have guessed that basically it involves uh, the use of time ordering. So the idea is that you cleverly uh, define a notion of time ordering in such a way that now this S matrix uh, no longer appears on either side of psi, it only appears on one side of psi. Okay? So one, if it appears only on one side then it is extremely convenient because you just have to expand that one. Uh, S which is sitting on one side, then you simply go ahead and expand that. So that is what I am going to try and convince you that it is possible at this stage, it is not at all obvious, it seems rather impossible. But uh, the reason why it is possible is because uh, you have to be a little clever, that means you have to introduce a notion of time ordering uh, in such a way that you can uh, achieve this. 
so now what is that notion of time ordering so that's the reason why i have to improve this lemma so you'll have to bear with me so things are rather technical now i mean but i have to motivate all this technical development and i have just told you what that is so the idea is that you see if you have a uh, operator psi which is the annihilation operator so I, f I forgot a dagger there's a dagger there okay so this is a misprint it should be a dagger psi it's not psi 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 dagger so you see there is this uh, annihilation operator which is annihilating a particle at x at time t and then psi dagger is creating a particle at x dash t dash so now the idea is that I'm going to prove to you that uh, there is a, uh, so I'm going to prove this identity. So basically the claim is that, so you can always write uh, the time ordered part of psi psi dagger this way, the full psi psi dagger. So this is uh, time evolution with respect to the complete Hamiltonian. So now this can be rewritten in terms of the time evolution with respect to the unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian multiplied by these two S matrices. So you might think that uh, I still have not uh, made one S matrix, there is still two S matrices on either side. Yeah, so you will have to be patient. So this is an intermediate step in that eventual goal where I am going to put all the S matrices only on one side. Right now there it is still on both sides here. But nevertheless I have to prove this in order to achieve that final goal. So the claim is that the time ordering of psi x comma t times psi dagger x dash t dash is given by an S matrix of this type. So remember I have defined what that S t dash, t dash is. So you go from minus to plus infinity and then the time ordering from here then back from plus to minus infinity. So remember that this S matrix is inside the time ordering, this is outside. So how do you prove this? I mean, uh, it's, it's just quite straightforward. All you have to do is you, you assume one case t is greater than t dash, right? So and then you uh, you use this uh, uh, this group property of this S matrix, okay? And then you start inserting, and uh, it's just straightforward. I'm not going to really f go through all the steps. So it's just you just keep uh, inserting, inserting and then you will get your result, okay. So it is pretty straightforward and uh, the proof for the other case is similar that if t is less than t dash also it is similar. So therefore, okay, so I am going to assume that you are all going to sit down and uh, follow all these steps which is very irritating to explain this verbally, okay. So you will have to sit down and do it yourself. So now uh, assuming that you have understood that then see therefore the expectation value of this sort of time ordering of these two operators again I, this is a misprint this is a dagger so um, with respect to some state is clearly given by the expectation value with respect to the the same operators but now evolving according to the unperturbed hamiltonian then sandwiched between these uh, two s matrices okay so now still not very convenient, still you have two S matrices and my goal of um, uh, making sure that the S matrix appears only on one side of these operators is still uh, elusive, it has not been reached. So now the question is how would you achieve that, okay. So, uh, so the way is that uh, I am going to make some uh, assumptions, okay. So the assumption is that uh, this, uh, this V of S is uh, while it is time dependent, it is adiabatic in the following sense. That means uh, adiabatic switching. So that means what that means is that uh, you imagine this external time dependent potential is 0 in the remote past and it is 0 in the remote future. So that means it is uh, switched on gradually in such a way that the state of the system, so that means you, you imagine that in the remote past that the system had a well defined energy, suppose you decide because after all there is no question of temperatures, there is a non equilibrium problem, so you can, uh, I mean it is not logically wrong to postulate that the system had a well defined energy in the distant past. 
So if it has a, dist uh, a well defined energy in the distant past, I am going to assume that that energy is non degenerate. That means there is exactly one state uh, which corresponds to that energy. So if that is the case, then if I switch on a perturbation and I do it very slowly, so there is a, a very good reason to expect that that state, so if, if I switch it on slowly, of course it is going to finally change. But then when I finally gradually switch it off, uh, so there is uh, every reason to expect that uh, the final state will basically be the same as the initial state. So the wave function will of the final wave function and the initial wave function will correspond to the same state. So that means they differ only by a phase. So you see the, the operator that takes the uh, initial state to the final state is this one. So it's the uh, it's the S matrix. You evolve this S matrix from from a distant past to the distant future. So that's what this is doing. So it's uh, it's evolving uh, the uh, states from the distant past to the distant future. Okay. So, uh, so the claim is that this state, so this is the final, so this is the initial state which is phi. So it had a well defined energy which is non-degenerate and because it is non-degenerate, uh, so it is like see if it was degenerate it will be a problem because what will happen is that the uh, perturbation can actually create a superposition between these two states which have the same energy. So the system kind of uh, gets confused which state it is in because they all have the same energy. So if the perturbation will try to kind of uh, you know jolt it into some superposition even though it was not in a superposition earlier, the perturbation can kind of suddenly reset that state into some superposition if the state was uh, degenerate. But we are not going to allow that. So we are going to postulate that the initial state was non-degenerate. So so if you if you slowly switch on and slowly switch off, then having switched off, you see the system is back in the original state. So so the worst that can happen is that two wave functions will differ by a phase. So that's what's going to happen here. So you see, there's this S matrix. You're uh, acting on the state, and you get a phase. By by the way, I don't recall if I misspoke earlier. So uh, in interaction picture the operators change according to the unperturbed see that is what is happening here right. So the operators are evolving according to the unperturbed Hamiltonian whereas the states are evolving according to the S matrix which is the perturbation. I might have said the reverse so I do not recall now but bottom line is this is what it is. So this is the final state uh, that uh, is same as the initial state so therefore they differ uh, at worst by some kind of a complex number of unit modulus. Okay, uh, so therefore uh, it is clear that its conjugate is this and uh, it is this so that uh, this e raised to i theta therefore is trivially equal to the expectation value of the S matrix. Okay, so now look at this part see what is this this is nothing but it is e raised to minus i theta. And what is e raised to minus? Uh, so it's e raised to minus i theta phi, right? So what is e raised to minus i theta? It is one divided by this. So which is basically so e raised to minus i theta is basically one by expectation value of phi s infinity minus infinity phi. So which is what this is means. So what I have done is basically I have written this as one by this. And now you see the numerator at least has only one S matrix. So you might think that so what the denominator has another and you are back to square one. So now you still have two S matrices. Now you see this interpretation is very convenient that even though superficially there still remain two S matrices one in the numerator one in the denominator. It is very convenient to do perturbation theory now because uh, you see if you expand in powers of those so imagine lambda is uh, imagine there is a lambda next to that v which is your pert time dependent perturbation. So now it is just a bookkeeping device which tells you how many v's are you are dealing with so lambda square means you are dealing with two v's. 
so later on you can put lambda equals 1 if you want. So bottom line is that you can ex expand this S matrix, make matrix in powers of this lambda and which just tells you how many V's you are dealing with. So now if you insert that expansion here in numerator and denominator, you will see that uh, and you expand the entire ratio in powers of lambda, you will see that what, what it tells you is that you just have to deal, see when you are calculating this expectation value, you just have to deal with the connected parts of this expectation value. So what that means is that uh, when you are evaluating this, uh, throw away any term which looks like this. That means throw away any term where the fields pair up with each other, means that they kind of ignore everybody else and pair up amongst themselves. So if they pair up amongst themselves, you kind of disregard that. Uh, so this is applicable to uh, even two point function. So, so this is one point Green's function. That means you are creating one, I mean you are creating one particle, destroying one particle. So you can create two particles, destroy two particles. So the same situation applies there also. So the idea is that in any, uh, so when you are trying to evaluate this, if you try to pair up, you know, you are forced to use, because you see, uh, remember that that is how you will be evaluating. You will be evaluating using something called Wick's theorem. I do not recall if I explicitly explained to you what is Wick's theorem. So Wick's theorem basically tells you that uh, if uh, you have a, okay, that is not in general applicable. So the bottom line is that basically it says that if in any calculation while trying to evaluate this, you will be uh, at some stage called upon to uh, split it up into uh, lower order moments. So this is a higher order moment, this S1 itself will contain uh, psi dagger psi and so on. So that is like the fourth, uh, four operators inside the expectation. So typically you will try to reduce that to fewer operators. So the point is that when you do that, uh, you will be um, pairing up uh, various pairs like this, this there might be psi dagger psi sitting in S1 like that. So you will be pairing the psi here with some psi dagger sitting inside S1 and so on. So the thing is that when you are doing that, what this uh, procedure says is that uh, just do not include the pairing which involves uh, pairing the original psi with uh, the original psi daggers. That means there were psi and psi dagger sitting there and uh, do not uh, don't include the pairing that involves uh, pairing these two and just I I include, so that those are, uh, those are the disconnected component because they are disconnected because they get disconnected. So there is the original pairing is disconnected with the S matrix, so they get separated out. So do not uh, include the disconnected pairing. So, uh, so basically even though this S matrix still appears in both places, this ratio still has the nice interpretation of only including the connected parts in the perturbation series. So which is why we introduce this uh, S matrix approach and this time, especially this time ordering uh, idea. So this time ordering is explained nicely in this picture, so I am going to so you can nicely uh, combine uh, various uh, ideas in this way. So, so this is called the Keldish uh, contour. Okay, so this is called Keldish. So I'm going to explain this maybe in the next class. So, uh, so in the next class, I'll tell you more about what this Keldish contour is, and uh, see where we can go from here. So basically, uh, this just tells you. Um, more details about non-equilibrium Green's function and finally there will be something called the Schwinger Dyson equation which is a very powerful uh, basically a functional differential equation for the Green's function of a many body system. So, uh, it is interesting to know that it is possible to write down those kinds of equations for the Green's function of a many body system. So, I will be just uh, explaining all those things one by one and uh, the problem is that you won't be able to solve any of these equations. You'll just be able to derive the equations, and solving them is very very hard. 
those are all topics of research so nobody knows how to solve them fully so you can still uh, do some tentative type of approximation and check against some numerical simulation that that is the best you can do so this course is more about uh, telling you what sort of questions are worth asking so this course doesn't provide any answers it just tells you what questions are worth asking so okay i'm going to stop here in the next class i'll continue with non equilibrium greens function mm -hmm.